I've been at Google nearly 10 years and literally for every one of those 10 years Andrew has been banging on about the shortcomings of the uh, internet. Um, and just now that, that everybody else is, has joined the, that game, he's moving on ever the contrarian to, to something else. So the, the, the new book is certainly not without its criticisms, trenchant criticisms of, uh, of Silicon Valley, but it, uh, also there's, there's suggestions on how to, uh, to fix the future and resolve some of the issues that he has banged on about for so long. So, um, welcome Andrew. Thank you Peter, and it's um, nice to be a wonderful uh, audience. Splendid turnout. So I suspect you are going to tell us, um, you told us so? <laughs> yeah, I, I, firstly I made a lot of mistakes as well. In one of my books I predicted that Facebook wouldn't survive. <laughs> so I am not as prescient as I'd like to think I am. I think I was a little lucky. I think I took a gamble on Cult of the Amateur in 2007. I mean, it seemed obvious to me, but it could have easily ended in a different way. I mean, I don't think there's anything inevitable about it. So uh, I, I think I was a little lucky, and, um, and I've made many errors along the way. So I, I don't want to sound too cocky here. And you talk uh, early on in the book about... Do yes. you think I was right? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in due course. Um, <laughs> he, uh, it's more interesting to, to get him some, to talk than certainly me. Certainly some important points. Yes. You definitely made some important points, and I, I, and I think... Uh, that's uh, a diplomatic so, way of saying I was right. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the points I, I would disagree with. But, <laughs> but uh, I always joke about my book. When, I, when my books come out, people always come up to me sort of half apologetically, and they say... We, we kind of agree with 60% of what you write, and I always joke, and it's not really a joke, well, so do I. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talk early on about, you, you say there's, there, there's people who are yes, there's people who are no, and there's people who are maybe, and you say yeah. you're, you're a maybe. So what yeah. does that mean? Well, maybe means that the revolution, the digital revolution that you guys are engineering more than anyone else, it has huge potential. It's the great event of the early part of the 21st century. In many ways, it's the equivalent of the mid-19th century the early 20th century industrial revolution, the next chapter, you know, some people call it the second machine age, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, it hasn't, I think in overall terms, it hasn't lived up to its billing. We were promised democracy, more equality, more jobs, a renaissance of culture. I don't think we've got that. I think we might get it, maybe, but at the moment it's not there. And there's a couple of terms that you use right the way through the book. I mean, you should explain what you describe as, as Moore's Law, which is right. not Moore's Law, but as Moore's Law. Uh, but you, you talk a lot about that, and you also talk about team human what, and what it means right. to be human. Well, Moore's Law is my phrase. Team human actually is Douglas Rushkoff, so I stole that one from him. But um, uh, you all know, of course, um, Gordon Moore's Law. Uh, the law, I think it, he, he came up with it, originally it was just a throwaway remark in 1965 that computer chips would double in power every 18 months or two years. That's the engine of the digital revolution. And usually when you read these books about, you know, Industry 3.0 and the second industrial revolution and the second machine age, there's always an opening chapter on Moore's law as the engine, as the driver of the change. It's, it's clearly a a law, a scientific law, whether it will continue forever is arguable, but so far it's driven the revolution. My argument in the book is that the problem with Moore's law, it's not a critique of Moore's law, I mean, you can't really criticize Moore's law, it's just an observation about the way the world works and the way technology works. But my observation about Moore's law is it's, it's the technology has moved so fast that it's actually got beyond humans. We are being outrun by technology and I think that explains why we're feeling in increasingly uncomfortable, awkward, disempowered in the face not only of all this amazing new technology uh, from the internet to AI to uh, augmented reality to uh, um, smart machines and all the rest of it, smart cars, but also in the context of large companies like yours, a lot of people feel intimidated put it politely, by, large, by the large platform players. There aren't many of them. You know who the others are. Um, so that's the reality. So how do we catch up with Moore's Law? How do we as humans catch up with Moore's Law? So I invent, at the beginning of the book, in chapter one, 
another kind of Moore's Law. This one is derived from Thomas Law, Thomas Moore, the author of uh, Utopia, 16th century Englishman. Most of you will have read his, or certainly familiar with his books from university or school. Uh, he, he, of course, famously wrote. Oh, so could you say about yeah. the feedback is a bit distracting? Sorry. Yeah, are we good now? Uh, yeah, so he wrote, um, he wrote a I, I would argue he wrote a very realistic book, which is in part a critique of utopia. But in the book, the heart of utopia, of Moore's utopia, I think, is a reminder to people that the core thing about their responsibility as humans is agency, to take responsibility for, for society and to build a better world. What Moore was reminding people in the 16th century, particularly in the light of Luther and predestination and all these incredibly disruptive, traumatic scientific discoveries which suggested that we weren't at the center of the universe and that God was so infinite, didn't matter how we behaved, we were still, you know, our, our fate was determined before we were born. What Moore was reminding people is actually human beings still count. That's for me what Moore's law is about. It's all about agency. My definition of humans in the 21st century is that we've invented these smart machines, or people like you are inventing these smart machines that can do most things. But the one thing they can't do is have agency. So the challenge for us in this age, not in smashing technology, not in controlling it, not necessarily in breaking up Google or Facebook or Amazon, but in managing the world, in building a better world that reflects our interests rather than the interest seemingly of technology, not that technology has its own interests, or the interests of large platforms. Moore's law is the guiding principle of my book, and I'm reminding people that the dominant theme in the 21st century is human agency. It's the one thing that distinguishes us from smart machines, because otherwise smart machines can do everything that we can do. And I think we, look, we, we obviously agree that, that the, the internet age has thrown up a whole lot of, yeah. of issues and society these days has all kinds of things that are uh, unappealing um, uh, about it. And you kind of come up with, with f five fixes that will help the future. Now, they're, not, I mean, they're not very controversial, are they? No, they're not um, at all controversial. And maybe you can rattle them off quickly. Well, it's important to remember that my argument is that we've always had five fixes as human beings, five broad areas where we've been able to deal with disruption and build a better world, or sort of, if you like, articulate Moore's law. The first is innovation, companies like Google. The second is regulation of companies like Google, perhaps. The third is uh, consumer choice and workers' choice. The fourth is citizen engagement, which is a kind of pure manifestation of Moore's law. And the fifth is education. And every time there's a great disruption, whether it's the Industrial Age or the Renaissance or the Reformation, we've always had these tools to shape a better world. The key, in my view, is that they work together. The, the mistake many people make is to rely on just one of these tools. So I think the mistake Silicon Valley has made has been to rely on the market. And I'm not saying, certainly Google UK, I'm not sure if you, you fall into that category, but of course, the, the Peter Thiels of the world and the Mark Andreessen's, these people believe that if you just stay out of it, the market will eventually resolve all scarcities and create a better world for everyone. I think we've been staying out of it for long enough to know that that's not the case. But on the other hand, of course, the Europeans, or you will probably tell me, the Europeans are too fixated on regulation, which maybe there's some truth to that. So you need a mixture of the, 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 the two. The key argument in the book, again, this is probably fairly self-evident, although not everyone in Silicon Valley will agree, is that there is no app to fix the future. There's no simple fix, just as there was no simple fix in the industrial age. It, it takes a generation. We need to be patient. And of course, patience in our networked age is something that doesn't always come to us naturally. Um, but uh, I sort of use the metaphor, the analogy of the tech stack in terms of these five tools and they're mixed together and sometimes you know some reg regulation is often innovative the best regulation and you you and I may disagree on this but I think for example what Margaret Vestager is trying to do in Brussels at least in her mind I interview her in the book um, she's trying to protect innovators she's not um, she's not punishing innovation she's not against innovation that doesn't mean all regulation is for innovation 
but uh, I think the best kind of regulation only works with innovation. I felt you were quite won over by Mrs. Vestire. Have you met her? Did you go in that famous office? No, no. She, she was probably nicer to me than she was to you. <laughs> she seemed very nice to you, definitely very, very helpful. But I th actually, you come out in favor of some things that are uh, perhaps quite surprising that you, you seem to be championing or supporting. I, I was quite surprised by Singapore, for example. Uh, and you, you, uh, you accept that it's not utopia, but your sort of theme is uh, the people who are trying to build digital utopia, and you point to Singapore, um, and indeed Estonia as, as example. Well, Estonia is my best model. If there is a utopia, it's Estonia, a small country, unique, obviously, post-Soviet place, which benefited because it was in, in the old Soviet Union, it was the sort of, uh, it was uh, the, the place where they, they had good technical universities. Now is, I think, the most wired, the worst network place in Europe, with tremendous, tremendously innovative policies in terms of e-citizenship, in re-architecting a, a social contract between consumers uh, or between citizens and government over data. I, I think you're right on Singapore. I'm ambivalent about Singapore. I think what Singapore is doing on, smart, on their Smart Nation initiative is interesting. But of course, the big question with Singapore is uh, the lack of democracy and the fact that as the nation becomes smarter and smarter in a, in a country without de democratic accountability, one can become quite nervous of the power of government over citizens. I would say that Estonia is the best case. The worst case is China. Uh, Singapore is somewhere in between. Yeah, I mean, you talk a lot about tr trust, trust, trust. It's, it's trust all about is, trust. yeah, but trust is the, you know, the two great scarcities, and again, you guys know this better than I do, the two great scarcities of our networked age are trust and attention. Um, and it's no coincidence that we have a crisis of trust, I think, in a digital age, particularly in the sort of a, uh, the, the age of user-generated content and social networks where everyone is continually undermining authority. Now, it's not just because of the internet. You know, Fox and MSNBC, and I'm sure a lot of English TV stations do the same thing. But there is a connection between the crisis of trust and the appearance of sort of network culture. But do you think people in, in this country, or indeed more broadly in, in Europe, would accept a government intervention at the, at the level that, that Estonia and, and Singapore do, and would trust them? Because I mean, the, level, the level of trust among Singapore citizens in their government is remarkably high. But I think yeah. if you try to do what Singapore does in, in the UK, you might get a very different outcome. Well, it's chicken and egg. I mean, the, the, the crisis in England, it's both England and America, I think, have a crisis of legitimacy of democratic institutions a sort of redundancy of political parties and ideologies. So where do you start to rebuild that? Um, the Estonian model is interesting in that um, I, I, I use the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is the sort of the gold standard for determining who trusts what, and it's always falling every year. It's amazing. Like he, he releases it every year at Davos, and every year it's the same story. There's less and less trust. But what do you think he found in Estonia was people trust the government, but they may not trust the political parties which is interesting. Um, I'm on the data front. I think what the Estonians are doing is interesting because they are, <coughs> I talked to the est former Estonian president who was the real architect of many of their reforms. This guy called Ilves, a very charismatic figure. His argument is that privacy is history. His argument is in the age of smart everything, it's increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to maintain a kind of 19th century version of privacy, the one that was protected in laws by people like Louis Brandeis in the US and John Stuart Mill in the UK. So what, what the Estonians have tried to do is say, OK, well, with all the digital reforms that the Estonians are doing, the government is going to know a lot about you, your health records, your tax records, your car records. Everything is online. Estonia is the first country to really go online. What the Estonians are trying to do, and I'm, I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's an interesting idea, is to say, look, we do know everything about you, but if we choose to look at your data, we will tell you. So the government has an accountability. It's a kind of almost, it, it's not based on blockchain technology, but it's a blockchain-like thinking, which may be one way of rethinking a social contract. Um, you know, we can cling to our romantic notions of privacy, 
I'm just not sure how realistic that is, particularly since we're on the verge of you know, smart everything, from cars to cities to bodies. Yeah. I don't quite know in this age how we protect our privacy, either from companies like yours or from governments. So perhaps, rather than trying to do that, which is a kind of Sisyphean task, it might be better to force the government under law to be much more accountable. So I think what the Estonians are doing is interesting. I think I'm more, as you can tell from the Singapore chapter, I'm a little bit more ambivalent. But I think it's too easy for you know, British or American people to write off the Singapore experiment. It's a miracle in economic terms. They have the best education system in the world. They have a remarkably innovative economy. So to write them off as sort of neo-authoritarian, I think is slightly unfair. But you, you, are, you are clearly pro-government. You're pro-statism. Is that, would you agree with that? No. <laughs> well, well, I mean, explain what you mean. I mean, well, like, the, 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 give me an example you're, of a... You're in favor of the, the intervention of, of governments to, to regulate I am in favor of regulation as one of the five tools. I believe that the biggest mistake in America was the sort of retreat of government from the digital terrain. I think you guys got very lucky with Safe Harbor. You guys, you know, Eric Schmidt did a very nice job on Barack Obama. Um, and, uh, you know, God knows what Trump's up to. But I think that the, the state, you call it, although it's the government, an elected government, has a responsibility to regulate some aspects. And I use the example of the Industrial Revolution with other <laughs> industries. So we look at food. Uh, without the regulation of the food industry, we'd all still be poisoned. Without the regulation of labor laws, you'd still have 11-year-olds in, in working in factories. Without regulation, uh, unions would still be outlawed. So I think you have to be realistic. Just this is an English audience. In America, I, I think people here are a little bit more realistic about this. In America, any time you suggest any kind of regulation, you're accused of being a Stalinist, which is absurd. It's just one piece of the puzzle, one bit of the stack. But to deny its significance, I think, is extremely unwise. I think it's unwise of you as well, not you personally, but your company. I think you, and I think you are acknowledging that government is a reality. I mean, we're in Steve Case's third stage where politics becomes relevant. I mean, if you didn't realize that, you wouldn't be spending so much money uh, lobbying in Washington, D.C. It's not a bad thing. Um, we need accountable government. I'm very disappointed in many ways with the U.S. government. Uh, but I think the, the EU government is doing a better job. Not ideal. I think some of the things that some of the European states are doing are absurd. You know, the, 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 the French-Spanish initiative to force Google to pay newspapers for sending them traffic from Google News is obviously absurd. It's an example of, 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 of short-sighted, of counterproductive regulation. Not all regulation is right, but I think the GDPR is an interesting initiative to make data portable. I think Vestager's work in antitrust and taxation is important. And I thought the com I thought the comparison you made with I mean, do you agree? Well, I, well, I was going to make a. Well, He's avoiding the question. <laughs> there's a, I, I thought the the comparison you made with the car industry yeah. and, and and Ralph Nader unsafe at any uh, at, at any speed was a very yeah, compelling and, one. And let me I mean, the only di the difference I would make there is that the because of po poorly designed cars, literally millions of people died. Yeah, that's true, but. So, so my argument about the American car industry, and again, I'm speaking to you, I guess, you know, you're, we're in Britain, but you're still an American company. My, my overall argument is I think some companies, perhaps including yours, have lost sight of their customers. In, I don't know who your customers are. Their users' interest. So I think your business model is profoundly flawed in the long term. I think it's flawed because it essentially transforms the user into the product. And whilst you, someone here will argue, well, people don't complain, you're right, but ultimately they will, I think. People don't want to be watched all the time. People don't want to be turned into the product. And I use the example of the American car industry, which was fat and happy in the 50s, so fat and happy indeed, that they started designing cars that were essentially death traps. Uh, Nader in 65 wrote his Unsafe at Any Speed that exposed the bad design and lack of respect for their users in the car industry. And, you know, pre-Tesla, the American car industry has never recovered. So I think it's important, whether it's Google or any other tech company, to think about the real interests of what their users want. Now, everyone, you know, in terms of search engine, obviously everyone wants a high-quality search engine, which you have. 
but you and I have had this conversation before. I still think people would like to pay for their search engine if they were guaranteed complete privacy and that their data would be left alone. I, I wish that you would offer that. I don't see why it's a problem. And you point to examples of organization, other organizations who are, who are doing that kind of thing. I mean, and that's, that's the market, isn't it, at, at work? If there is demand for it, uh, people will, will come. Yeah, but, but it's the old Steve Jobs argument as well. You know, if Steve Jobs had waited for the market, we never would have had the iPhone. You guys know your market and the mentality of your users better than anyone. And I think in a sense, it, you need to become a little bit more responsible and accountable in pushing your users. It t towards, say, paying for services. I, I don't, you know, whether it's in content, uh, in YouTube, whether it's on search, I think that the biggest tragedy of the history of the web was our fetishization of free. I think that has been the most destructive mistake. I think it's essentially destroyed the media industry or m much of the media industry and has spoiled consumers into thinking that they shouldn't have the right to pay for stuff, which you know, it's very misleading and destructive. And, so, and subscription is something that is coming, both in, in news yeah. and in, in which is music. good, which I, I hope, you know, larger companies like yours would get behind. Uh, it offers another business model. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the big disagreement I would have with you about the book is that, as far as I could see, there, there literally is no acknowledgement of the benefits uh, of technology in the book. And, and the last time, <laughs> we the had last the time Python, you were here, I, we did play a rather cheap shot, which was to play you the, the famous, <laughs> Can we what, do what did the Romans again? ever do for us uh, clip from Monty Python, which I haven't got today, but I'm going to read the quote, which okay. is what John Cleese says, all right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, the education, the wine, uh, public order, irrigation, roads, fresh water, uh, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Um, that okay, but I could, you know, we're not, we're not doing Monty Python now, but we can pretend to do Monty Python. And I could say, and I wouldn't, but I could say, <laughs> um, uh, fake news, technological addiction, Increasing and inequality, the book monopoly. Is full of that. The book is full of that. But so, but 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 my but he, but here's the point: is that we're Peter, we're beyond that discussion now. I wrote. Yeah, Whenever, well, let me come back on this. This is not a book about that. Everyone acknowledges that the internet's done amazing things. That's not the issue anymore. We've moved on from that debate. It's it's not useful anymore yeah, to be but, continually but discussing whether or not the internet has benefited humanity. Okay, Clearly, it's done some good, and there are lots of problems. So what I'm doing in the book is saying, okay, no, you know, I, I don't, what's the point of? It's, it's like some sort well, of political well, correctness but, that every but, time I read a book, I have to explain no, no, but, why but, the internet's but the great. Point, no, but, the but, but the point, but there should be an acknowledgement. There should be a balance because the point why? is. Why? Well, well, when I speak to you, you're, you're very reasonable. Then I read your book. And, 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 so, this is not okay, an unreasonable a couple, book. A, okay, a couple of... No, it's, not, it's not generally speaking not an unreasonable book. But let me give you a generally couple of quotes from the book. <laughs> Much of the digital innovation of big tech companies like Google and Facebook isn't currently working. Yeah. Come on, you can't stand by that. I mean, you can speak to your, your well, phone let's, let's in, in Spanish let, and it'll answer you in English. Let's pick on our friends in Facebook. Let's leave Google out of this. Do you think, <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's anyone from Facebook. Do you own Facebook yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's next week, right? No um, is Facebook working? It's infested with fake news. Zuckerberg has absolutely no idea of where to go in terms of his business strategy. Kids wouldn't be seen dead on Facebook. Um, it's, it's the perfect sort of place, you know, Putin spends, you know, millions of dollars a year hiring people to post lies on Facebook. Um, I think mostly, and, and we see more and more research showing that kids are addicted to this thing. Again, it doesn't mean that everything about Facebook is bad. We don't need to get into that. But I would say in overall terms, Facebook is not working. And I think even Zuckerberg's acknowledging, I mean, he acknowledged that most people now realize that Trump one of the main reasons why Trump won the election was because the Russians gamed Facebook. Is Facebook working? I would acknowledge that there are, there are d definitely issues. And oh, yeah. By the way, our, our, point, our point is, please hold us to account for what we do, and generally speaking, don't bundle us uh, together and bundle us together in the same sentence oh. with, with other okay. people. But uh, look, here's another quote, here's another quote which, I, uh, which I find... Uh, going a little far, it seems almost normal for online audiences of millions to watch revenge porn, live beheadings and suicides. That's not true. Isn't it? No. <laughs> it, almost normal. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it depends on your, your definition of almost yeah. normal. But, but would you accept that there has been a profound sort of corrosion of the culture and that um, 
the, 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 the kind of content on, on this media which is abs where, where there's lacking curation is very troubling in many ways. The, you know, the, the infestation of sexism and racism and, and, and sort of cults of violence, those are realities. My point is, I don't think, I think that, you know, if you want me to, uh, I'm going to do it again, I'm going to bundle you and Google and Facebook all together. I think you have to acknowledge, and we've had this conversation before, you have to acknowledge that your media companies and that you have a responsibility for the content that's published on your network. You have the same responsibility as a newspaper or a movie studio. And I think the sooner you, not you personally, but certain companies acknowledge that, the better for everyone. Do you, do and I, look, and I don't disagree with that, with that? And, and, I, and, I, and I would agree with what you talk about, which is the, the combinatorial approach, right. which is it's, there's, no, there's no one club to fix these problems, it's a range of things. And I think actually if you look at, at hate speech or violent extremism yeah. online, well, you're it, doing that, it has I, been I do, a combinatorial, combinatorial approach. what some of the things you're doing. I, what I argue though is that we can't just rely on your generosity to humanity. Uh, that the only way that large tech companies are coming to the table to fix these solutions is when they're threatened with major fines. You only do it with the bottom line threat. Uh, it's not enough to just tell these people to take responsibility. And that's why I think I applaud some of the, you know, even what the, the Germans are doing with, with YouTube and, and some of the other media. I, I think that's the only way it works. And I think the other mistake, uh, since we're on a Facebook Google ran. Um, the other mistake that's happened, I'm not sure if this is certainly not true of you, but of some people in these large tech companies, is that they believe their own hype. They, they believe their own Kool-Aid, or they've drunk the Kool-Aid so much that they've started to believe it. And one of the delusions of, and I think this was true of Google in an early stage, maybe not now, but you know, in the early days, and Larry and Sergey and the do no evil stuff, it was this idea that you could be incredibly successful and do good simultaneously. And that you were, and Facebook, you were breaking the mold of capitalist companies. That the typical capitalist company was an oil company or a, or a big bank, and they, weren't, they may not be evil, but they had no benefit to humanity. The idea of the Google IPO and the Facebook IPO and so much of the the kind of ideology that came out of Silicon Valley in the Web 2.0 age up until maybe three or four years ago was that we are different. We are reinventing, re-architecting capitalism. And I don't think that's true. I don't think big tech companies are any worse than, you know, big banks or, or big pharma companies, but they're no better either. Yeah, and actually, one, one thing that Do you I agree. That, well, one one thing up to a point. One thing that I, one thing that <laughs> up to a point that struck me about the book was that not a great deal of mention of of the, the user, yeah. um, and I think the, the the big difference with 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 Google and and, and other tech companies is, yeah. is that we are extremely answerable to the user, and when we get yeah. things wrong, that uh, we hear about it uh, very very quickly. I think that's a fair point, and I still think, you know, the since you're being so frank and open, I, I think one of the weaknesses of the book is that I still assume that users will rebel. And most, I, I'm sure you do a lot of research in how happy your users are, and I assume they're reasonably happy. My fear and prediction is that we still haven't had a major data event. We still haven't had an Exxon Valdez or certainly a Chernobyl. And I still feel something will happen. It may be a state-to-state -state digital event which will open people's eyes. You know, I did, you know, Click, you know, the, the, the bird media search engine that's designed to take on um, Google. I did a, when, when their uh, chief technology officer, Belgian guy, I think he's an old friend of Larry and Sergey, very smart guy. He, we sat in, a, in their office in Munich and he showed me how much you can find out about anyone online if you know what you're doing. And I think when you show regular people that, they would be terrified because people still value their privacy. Yeah, and I like the line that you use about nothing, 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 and then bang, and you kind of, you're kind of suggesting that. Yeah, and I think it's always at a time where, you know, no business model, no company lasts forever. I think, since I'm being self-critical, we another weakness of the book is on the one hand, I worry about monopolies and huge companies, and on the other hand, I predict their demise. So I think there is some, I mean, I wouldn't talk about that publicly, of course, but I, I think there is I some inconsistency. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, but YouTube's biased, right? We can, we right? can edit. We can edit. <laughs> There's only beheadings. Are we going to have a, a ritual beheading at the end? <laughs> so, um, 
towards towards the end of the book, you talk you talk about the kind of public spiritedness of uh, and uh, and education, the need for education, yeah. and, and actually you talk about the the universal uh, basic income uh, as well, which I think you kind of come out in support of. Yes. Um, look, uh, universal, you know, coming out against universal income is basic income is like coming out against apple pie or, uh, you know, babies. I mean, I come well. from, I, I'm, I'm a Northern Irish Protestant. I think our yeah. Northern Irish Protestant view is if you give people money without a job, they're going to spend it on drink. Well, that's true in Northern Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but what do you make of the argument? And again, it's a popular argument in Silicon Valley. What do you make of the argument that... Um, that technology may take away so many jobs that there just aren't going to be jobs. What's everyone going to do? Not everyone can work for Google. You know, Google, what, what's the market cap of Google? It's almost a trillion. How many people work for you? 70, 80,000. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So, and, and, and we know there'll be less and less as AI becomes more and more central in your company. Um, the thing about what I like about the guaranteed minimum income is it's thinking big. Just as in the middle of the 19th century, there was no social security net no way of protecting unlucky workers from the ravages of cap industrial capitalism. So Bismarck, who certainly was anything but a socialist, um, pioneered social security. Then it was developed in Scandinavia, in the UK, in, 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 in the US. Um, I think we need to be thinking in those big terms. My problem with universal basic income is it seems to satisfy the conscience of Silicon Valley billionaires like Sam Altman. But I'm not sure if we have, you know, 80% of the people in our, in our society living on $2,000 a, a month, uh, the whole world will look like San Francisco. Be, you know, a, a few noblemen and barons in their mansions and everybody else living out on the streets. So the problem, I think, with universal basic income is it can kind of institutionalize the already, the, the, the inequalities of our age. And you're right, I mean, look, we, 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 you and I grew up in, in, in the age of the dole in the UK, where a lot of people did just sit on the dole and do nothing and drink and watch TV. Um, so that is an issue. But I think we need to think creatively. In the book, I, uh, I go to Switzerland, which is the first country to have a referendum on it. This is becoming a real issue. It's a real issue in Finland. It's an issue in Canada. It's an issue in Brazil. We need to think big. We can't just fall back on the old certainties, because they don't work. I mean, what do you think about you know, every economist from, you know, even McAfee and Bryn Johnson, who are <coughs> relatively optimistic, are concerned about the impact of smart technology on jobs. Just because technologies in the past have created jobs doesn't guarantee it in the future. Um, so I, I do think we have to acknowledge this. And if indeed this technology, as many economists predict, do put 30, 40 percent of us out of work, We've got to come up with something. No, Otherwise, sure. you know, there's revolution on the street. People are, you know, people have nothing to eat. It, it's an important issue to, to think about. Yeah, and look, I, I would say that you know, the, the experience of history is that technology has made the world a better place uh, every single time throughout history, and there's no reason to suppose that the, well, the, the, the last wave is going to be any yeah, different. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that there's not bumpiness or. But it depends, right. But um, th that's a sort of a linear view of the world. I think if you lived in Germany in the 1930s, technology wasn't making the world a better place. Certainly the experience of the Soviet Union didn't make the world a better place. So you can, you can find examples of how the Industrial Revolution worked, and you can find examples of how the Industrial Revolution failed. And even, you know, I talk about environmental regulation and the way in which uh, the Industrial Revolution in that sense has been tamed. But we know from people like Naomi Wolf that you know, global warming remains a huge problem, may indeed be the biggest problem of all with, with smart, smart uh, machines. So, um, no, I think it's, it's bumpiness along the way, and that's the purpose of, but, but of, it's not of a, but, polemics but, like yours. But my book is a map. I use the metaphor of the map, but it's not like a Google map where you go from point A to B. It's a much more complicated map. The future is not linear. And just as we move forward, so there'll be new challenges, new opportunities. There are many routes into the future, many opportunities. So I, I think there was also no singular route. As you know, the book is, you know, it deals with Estonia and Germany and Europe and the US and India and Singapore. And I suggest that there are many routes. And that the <coughs> idea that the internet creates a one world global village, I think, has been proved to be wrong. Now, it doesn't mean I glorify what's happening in China or Russia, 
But I think we have to acknowledge the reality of the splinter net. That is the future of the digital world, for better or worse. OK, we're going to go to some questions from the audience in a second, so get ready. But just, just before that, just some quick questions. What one word answers, or actually a, okay. a symbols, or a thumbs up, okay. big thumbs up, or big thumbs down. Okay. okay, big thumb up or big thumb down. Bitcoin. <laughs> in what sense? Well, it, <laughs> are you, are you broadly favorable? On balance, are you in favor, or is it a good thing or a bad thing? More, more or less than 50% favorability. Well, can I say that, but then I would say for blockchain that. Yeah. Okay, blockchain do that. Okay, Uber. I use it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> up and down. Uh, uh, up. Especially since Travis isn't there anymore. Add block plus. Up. Up. That sounds amazing. What do you think? Well, you, uh, you've appropriated that, right? Haven't you built that into Chrome? <laughs> well, we, we, we've acknowledged that there are And issues. let me ask you this question, since we're, we're all family here. <laughs> What's... Aren't you killing your own business by introducing Adblock into, into Chrome? Trying to make the, 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 improve the, the overall ecosystem in which we acknowledge there are problems. Is um, that a political? Next thumbs up or the thumbs down. Karl see? Marx. <laughs> thumbs down. Facebook. Well, you know that one. Google. I, since I'm here and you're always there. <laughs> No, I look, I, I'm, as, I'm as Googled as anyone. I probably use it a million times a day. I, what I don't have, though, is a Google account. I had to do this interview on, you still have this thing, what is it, Google chat? Uh, what's, that guy you, what's the thing you screwed up in social media? Uh, Google Plus. No, yeah, or Google chat, I don't know. Some, but I don't have a Google account. I don't use Gmail. So I sort of have this romantic idea that, None of you are watching me, although I'm sure you are, because <laughs> I just use the search engine without having a Gmail account or a, a Chrome account. So, but I, I, you know, Google has, I couldn't write my books without Google. I could write my books without Facebook. In fact, I'm not on Facebook, so, you know. Questions? Adam? Oh, oh, sorry, microphone coming. And very fair questions, by the way. Peter is a gentleman. <laughs> Hey, Andrew. Thanks, Hi. thanks for writing another great book about us. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think that... It's a great book. Have you read it? I, I've just skimmed a little bit of it. It's enough. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually skimming the bits about Vestager in, uh, in Brussels. I, I think everyone in this room would agree that there is a need for regulation. And uh, in some of the examples that you cite, things like the Corvair or meat yeah. safety, food safety regulations, even antitrust going back to Standard Oil, it was always based on evidence. And I think that what I see a little bit in the bits of your book that I just skimmed and a lot of this discussion around these issues is a lot of rhetoric, a lot of argument, and not a lot of evidence. Well, Vestager has, again, I'm not but you're, to you're, you're actually just relying on her to, well, to say, well, she's not some, you know, schmo off the street. I mean, she has, what, three antitrust investigations of you guys. Um, and the stuff on, you know, I, you know, I was, looks after the antitrust investigations. Right. So, <laughs> well, so I'm not sure whether we can have a, a you know, a, whether we have a compromise here. But, um, you know, I mean, the stuff on travel, I mean, that stuff is real. That's let not me an invention. Let me put it another way. What we've always had is a press or people like you who write books that actually uh, are independent and look at these issues in an independent yeah. way. Um, there was evidence that the Corvair was deadly before regulators intervened. Yeah. And it wasn't just Ralph Nader standing up saying, like, I don't like this car. We actually based regulation on a system of rules and a system of evidence. And I think what's interesting about the internet is that it, nobody feels obliged to use those standards anymore. Maybe the standards should shift, but right. I don't think that the discussion. Well, let's, but let's use the example of Uber. You know, yeah. I recently saw a report this week that suggested that the average Uber driver earns three, three, I think it's three dollars fifty an hour. Um, and in the book, I talk about the way in which again, I don't pick on Uber, there are other sharing companies do the same thing, are not conforming to laws in terms of protecting the rights of their workers. I mean, th these are real things. I mean, they're not to be ignored. It doesn't make them necessarily robber barons. They may not be equivalent of the textile mills where people lose their arms um, and, you know, 11-year-old slave away. But still, it's a problem. These are issues that need to be resolved. Um, you know, fake news is another huge issue that has implications in our politics and our culture. Uh, the impact of, you know, technology in terms of addiction is also very real. So I think it's unfair to say it's that. Alive, those things, right? They have to, each one has to be based 
No, I, I agree. But you, so you're particularly talking about antitrust. I mean, look, you know a lot about more. You'd kill me on an antitrust argument. But I, I, I'm not sure you'd kill Vestager. I mean, she's killing you with them. It's work in progress. Um, <laughs> question here. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. So you're kind of attributing to tech companies the responsibility for fake news, lack of democracy, the spread of sexism, racism, and so on and so on. But well, you kind of mentioned it in your talk. And uh, But isn't like the tech companies, they are the light that shown and show that there are problems because they're always been there. And just the smartphones gave access to uh, express themselves to Uber drivers, which was before reserved to Oxbridge educated white uh, 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 men who are, you know, writing in the Times. Now everyone can express themselves, and suddenly we see all this, you know, kind of I've, yeah, issues, I've been making, and we can yeah, address that this and we can change uh, it. I, I think, you know, I've, I've been arguing against the idea that somehow it's that the old elite, I mean, you have new elites firstly, I mean, you have people with, you know, millions of Twitter followers, huge YouTube following. So we have a new elite. Uh, it, maybe it's not an Oxbridge elite, although I'm sure some of these people went to the top universities. In fact, if anything, I think that we have a, um, a, a sort of a narrow elite and the disappearance of, of, of a middle in, in, in this culture. Um, look, I'm not blaming all... I mean, you can't blame Facebook or uh, YouTube when people, you know, when people do really nasty things. But I, I do think that under law there needs to be more accountability because otherwise, how do you clean it up? Um, the problem is, again, without will it, wishing to acknowledge that they're a media company, they're not hiring curators. And the only way to fix the problem is not through an algorithm, but through people. And it's also a way of creating jobs. Hi. Um, I wanted to touch on what you said on UBI. Um, and I agree with you that we have a certain amount of responsibility for disruption in the job market and automation and all of that kind of thing. Um, but I would argue that actually we need to think even bigger than UBI and think about how much actually what we put a monetary value on. So for instance, and there's also like a feminist argument here that a lot of care work, et cetera, doesn't have yeah. a monetary value. It's a lot of stuff that yeah. people do, emotional labor, um, the good, good in society that we don't put a, a monetary value on. And actually society should be valuing that. So actually that's kind of swathe of things. I think that it isn't controversial to say we should have a universal basic in income for those yeah. people. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, w w what s the smart machines are doing is making us realize that certain human things like empathy and sympathy and the ability to communicate, these are the things that we need to focus on. And I think we need reforms. And in my education chapter, I focus on this with Waldorf education and other humanistic traditions. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, uh, you know, it's clearly technology is beneficial in, in many ways. I mean, the invention of the washing machine was one of the most remarkable inventions of, of, of in human history. It liberated women from, you know, cleaning clothes, which is a remarkable step forward. Uh, obviously, no one would ever criticize that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so the, the key, though, is to figure out how, if you like, to monetize empathy what kinds of new companies are going to exist that build their business models around empathy, the services and the products. So, you know, you may, it's the old argument, you may have machines that can detect sickness and illness and disease, but you won't have machines that can tell someone that they're sick. That's always going to be a human thing. And I have you, asked the, you asked the question of what, what are humans good for? So yeah. what, what are humans good for? Well, I think the humans are good for agency. Humans are good. Uh, this might seem a, a, an avoidance for the question, but humans are good for the very things that smart machines can't do in, in the smart machine age. You know, the idea, I, I, I'm a little wary of defining humanity. It's such a big word, and it's so kind of meaningless and amorphous. So I argue that every age we have a different definition of what humanity is, and I suggest in the 21st century, what it means to be human is being able to do things that smart machines can't do. So it's, it's the empathy, it's the, it's the agency stuff that, that, I, that, that laces the book. I do have one question for you guys. Maybe you can answer or maybe there's someone in the audience. I'm interested in, um, you know, the, I do have one section on kind of moral responsibility of the new elite. What you think the responsibility, not necessarily of you individually, but of the senior executives at this company, particularly uh, the founders of the company, how they should actually be and I want to just pick on them. I mean, you could include Zuckerberg as well and Benioff and Bezos. What they should be giving back to society and whether the 
analogy of uh, Carnegie is a useful one yeah. and 19th century rubber barons. Do you? No, I thought that section was, was interesting. And, and, you, and you spoke uh, pleasantly about DeepMind. Uh, yeah. You were, uh, it gets good press, DeepMind. Yeah. And uh, actually, well, interestingly, you didn't mention Sundar Pichai at all in, yeah. the, in the book. And again, I think. Should I, I have? I, well, yeah, I think you should. And, and I think actually Sundar That's probably unfair. would, would yeah. probably agree broadly with your, your five uh, principles. Certainly the way what about Larry and Sergey? I, th I think they would too. I mean, I, I and Eric, I think I th everyone, <laughs> the, whole, the whole gang. I, I make it very clear in the book that I'm not against the market and I'm not against capitalism, but on the other hand, that doesn't justify everything. I, I just did an interview with Chris Hughes, the co-founder of Facebook. In the beginning of his book, he said he made half a billion dollars for three years of work as an undergrad at, 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 at uh, Harvard because he happened to share a dorm room with Mark Zuckerberg. Got very lucky. Acknowledged he got very lucky. He says that's wrong. And I think your point is, is a fair one. My, look, my book can't deal with everything. Piketty has already written, and a number of other economists have written important books about the inequality seemingly inherent in um, contemporary capitalism. I, I, I'm not an economist, and I couldn't really address that. But I, I agree. I think the problem is one of contemporary capitalism. But increasingly, it's becoming digital capitalism. And the kind of wealth that's being created for individuals, I think, it's just unhealthy for everyone, including them. I mean, in the book, I suggest, I think, the nine wealthiest people in Silicon Valley, if you add up all their wealth, it's the same as you know, two billion people in the world. That's just unacceptable. Now, you can't blame Silicon Valley for that. They're playing by the same rules. They're not, they're not acquiring that wealth illegally. But it is a huge problem. And ultimately, it doesn't benefit the tech community because you have the vilification of tech. Tech is, you know, when you have Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz and Steve Barron all talking about antitrust, all saying that there's a problem in Silicon Valley, then there's a problem. Last question here. Um, you mentioned that one of your assumptions <coughs> is that at some point consumers or users will rebel. Um, yeah. What do you think would be the tipping point? What would it take? Well, as I said, I, I think a, a major, when it comes to, say, your business model, a major data event. No, David Kirkpatrick, who's a very well-known and responsible, respected tech journalist. He used to be the tech editor of Fortune. He wrote the book on the history of Facebook. I bumped into him at CES uh, in, in January. He said to me that there's rumors that the Chinese government is actually acquiring all the data of everyone in America, and that's a sort of form of economic or data war. Now, I don't know if that's true, but if people like Kirkpatrick are talking about that, it becomes a reality. And it's clear with what the Russians have done in terms of American democracy. It's clear what the Russians are doing with every election in Europe, from you know, Italy to Czechoslo Czech Republic to the UK and Brexit, that, that there are a lot of problems with what's going on in the data world in, in, in politics. So I think stuff, you never know what's going to happen, but stuff will happen. Stuff so serious that it will wake people up. You know, no one could have, I guess you could have predicted Chernobyl, but no one did until it happened. And then it seemed obvious and inevitable, and the same will happen. I think your, ch I mean, this is really my message to Google, is you're dominant. You've won, you think you've won, or I'm not saying you, but it seems to me as if you think you're, you're so far ahead that you can't be caught. I think, as always in human history, the rules of the game change with you know, Harold Macmillan's famous remarks about, you know, why, why did you change your mind? He said, events, dear boy, events. And that's what's going to happen here. Events, dear people, events. And then you will see. I don't know what it's going to be. I have no idea. But digital's becoming central in everything, particularly in state-to-state -state relations. And my guess will be that somehow China will be involved. China is a much bigger threat, I think, both to Google and to the US and the West and, and Russia. I think we got it wrong with Russia. I mean, they are, of course. They're like a, a fly. They're an annoying fly. And, 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 and China is much larger, much more destructive, much more problematic in the long run, and much more sophisticated in their use of data. With that, Andrew Keaton, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.